Hello class, this is your professor, Joseph Stenard, and I'm glad that you are listening to a discussion about international economics. We're covering today topics such as philanthrocapitalism, microcredit, poverty, and the economic hitmen. Our economist of the day is none other than Mohammed Yunus. That's right. Professor Yunus is a, uh, a philanthropist and a professor of economics. He's dedicated to working towards creating a poverty-free world. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2006 for his work in microfinance. He is the founder of Grameen Bank, and he suggests an alternative social business model that looks to the good that is done by the business as their bottom line, but also with an eye towards maintaining the uh, cost structure and, and revenue stream that would make it self-sustaining. So rather than a social model that looks only to profit, it looks to uh, make sure that it does lots of good and pays all of its bills. There was a, a story that he told that when he was teaching uh, in Bangladesh, he was uh, teaching economics and he walked out of his university and he saw some basket weavers that were very poor even though they looked very um, they were very productive and it turns out that they were essentially in slavery the people that were uh, basket weavers because they couldn't buy their own uh, bamboo and so they had to uh, loan money at extraordinary interest rates from the bamboo sellers the money lenders and then and the money lenders required that these uh, basket weavers would sell the the baskets back to the money lenders at a very very low price which meant they were essentially slavery their slave labor only earning a couple pennies per day and so even though the problem is very complex the solution was very easy Muhammad Yunus eradicated poverty in his town at least in, among the basket weavers by giving them twenty eight dollars and freeing forty three people from slavery and those forty three people were so happy and it made them so uh, free that that small amount that he knew that he could do it and and that's what microfinance is all about also uh, Mohammed Yunus is uh, credited with uh, turning 20,000 beggars into 20,000 door-to-door salesmen he would loan ten dollars to people living in a box on the side of the road and 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 show them how he they could pay back that loan by turning uh, their entrepreneurial skills and uh, selling melons or collecting water or digging a lat latrine or providing some kind of service and and it's little steps like that that I think it's uh, so amazing and useful for you to think about some of his quotes are I am dedicated to the eradication of poverty and I believe everyone is an entrepreneur when we say microcredit or micro loans it's quite different from the current loan system that we have right you provi provide a means for a very poor person to borrow money. We have a system of distrust in our financial system. We loan money only to people that don't really need the, to loan the money and we require collateral and all sorts of proof from them. In microcredit you loan money to people that have nothing and yet because it's their only opportunity out of poverty they do pay it back. In fact most of the time they, they uh, have a better rate of return than uh, our system and our loans provides that necessary capital to people that are entrepreneurial, they have a uh, willingness to work, they have good ideas, so they have the land and the labor and the entrepreneurship, but they're lacking a little bit of capital. An example of microcredit would be to loan someone a, enough money to, to buy a used sewing machine and some cloth and thread, and then they have the capital to uh, go into business and make clothes for their village. Inspired by Mohammed Yunus, who is a personal friend of mine, is my friend Jess, Jessica Jackley Flannery. She and her husband Matt at Kiva.org. If you would like to know a little bit about Kiva.org, I have this link for us to follow. Where does poverty come from? Primarily, poverty comes from exploitation. Somebody who doesn't have any political power or position is able to be uh, uh, in a position to be taken advantage of by someone else and that person instead of showing mercy they exploit that other person so for instance uh, slavery or in the case of the uh, money lenders in Bangladesh 
in the cases of uh, um, war-torn areas where the person who is powerful can, can uh, squeeze out the resources from some other group. The kind of problems that we see in poverty around the world is sometimes a very deliberate measure on someone's part to uh, allow folks that don't need to be in poverty to be in poverty. For instance, the United States makes enough food to feed everyone in the world, and yet because of problems with distribution and logistical and infrastructure supports, they're not able to reach that. Po poverty can be caused by famine uh, and other cyclical reasons like that, but um, when it boils right down to it, the fundamental right that people have to their own labor and their own uh, ability to uh, make choices about themselves and, and have, have choices of movement to uh, other labor markets are being restricted. And that um, is where poverty comes from. And the remedies would be in fixing those very problems. An economist named Lorenz came up with a measure of egalitarianism or equal distribution. And the Lorenz curves is uh, illustrated on this slide here. We have uh, a perfect distribution is the 45 degree reference line that allows for the distribution of income to match the cumulative distribution of the population so that on the equal distribution line 50 percent of the income earned in a country would be distributed among 50 percent of the people and 75 percent of the income would be distributed among the 75 percent of the people. But in reality most, uh, Lorenz pointed out, that many countries have an unequal or non-egalitarian distribution of income, so that the first 25%, uh, that is the poorest 25% in a country, might only get 5% of the income, and that, that the 50% of the country, of the, the population, might only have 10% uh, of the national income, whereas a large percentage, perhaps 70% of the national income, is concentrated in the top 25, 5%, or 10%. This is very true, but there is some arguments against the Lorenz curve. I want you to understand what it looks like. So if you glance at this graph on the right, we see that there's actually five Lorenz curves. There's the green, perfectly egalitarian 45 degree line. And then there's something that's labeled as G33, which is somewhat uh, less egalitarian than pure, e pure equality, but it's the most egalitarian of the other slides. Then as you get further and further away from the perfectly egalitarian line, you get a totalitarian government that would, which is uh, completely all wealth and income is concentrated in the top 1% or even one person, such as in uh, Kim uh, Jong-un of uh, North Korea. One argument that you could make against the Lorenz curve is that since they're looking at income rather than wealth, that, that they're only looking at uh, earners. And for instance, in our own country, we have a, uh, about 140 million people that are earning a living, and the other 170 million are not working and not part of the labor force, and therefore you might say that their income is fairly low. They might, it might be low because they're living with someone that has a high income. They may have retired already or other things. So if you think about the Lorenz curve, it can be somewhat ingenuously used. It might be mis- uh, representing the the actual situation. There's a lot of people that choose to be in a, uh, temporarily anyway, in a low income area, or low income uh, bracket this particular year. For instance, if we looked at my family, we've got members of my family that are retired and members of my family that are still going to school or their their children. And, and that's a significant part of the population. Their income is very low this year, but, but they will have high incomes in the future or they used to have high incomes when they were working. And so maybe a, a Lorenz curve that's less than perfectly egalitarian isn't such a bad thing. You guys look at the numbers behind it. Part three of our talk is uh, The Economic Hitman. That's John Perkins on the left, and he wrote this book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He uh, comes clean as a writer and breaks his silence as an economic hitman, the term that they used. He exposes the world of international intrigue and corruption that's turning the American Republic into a global empire that is often despised by an increasing number of people around the planet. Now, he uh, has uh, describes himself as having other lives, too. He grew up poor. His parents uh, were teachers in New Hampshire, and he was able to get all sorts of contacts with some very 
rich and wealthy people because of the prep school that they taught at. But he also became very um, enamored with wealth, and it made it easy for him to be corrupted. This is why he writes it himself, and that's why he calls it Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And he says he writes about some very, very evil things that he did. So uh, we're going to look at that right now. But we'll do it by putting you in a position. We're going to make you the president of a, uh, of a developing country. And you have a problem or opportunity, uh, El Presidente. Your country has petroleum reserves deep in the earth in a remote area. Perhaps it's five um, miles deep underneath the mountain range in a very remote area of the jungle. So it's going to be very hard to reach it. But what are your options? How are you going to convert this wonderful resource of light, sweet crude oil into growth and productivity, employment, and a better standard of living or a better quality of life for your people? You have this resource. Should you just leave it in the ground or should you use that resource in an intelligent, good way to help your people? That's the challenge. And you basically have two choices. One of them is called foreign direct investment and the other is the economic hitman. Let's take a look at those two. In foreign direct investment, companies with an interest in the petroleum will contract with their country's government for drilling rights. This company might be, if in case of its oil, it might be Shell Oil or Exxon Mobil or, or uh, British Petroleum or anything else. Any country company that is willing to take the risk and invest in your country will go through the trouble and use their factors of production and their capital that they have under their control to develop the means for extracting the oil and getting it to market. Now that could be very extensive, right? The companies, though, are taking the risk and making the investments and developing the infrastructure and hopefully are rewarded with the profits. We should pause for a moment and make sure you know what infrastructure is. Things like um, electric uh, grid and, and, and uh, ports and railroads and roads and um, cell towers and uh, all of that type of thing and electric poles and generating plants and hydroelectric plants and, and a shipyard. All these things are part of the infrastructure that would be necessary, building a pipeline and so forth in order to get the oil from where it is right now deep in the ground and deep in the jungle to markets where people actually uh, want it and will pay for it. Now, if you use foreign direct investment, then you make a contract and license it. And El, and El Presidente, if you did this, the company would, would uh, send in uh, engineers, petroleum engineers, and try to determine how much oil it was and how difficult it would be to get and then they would make a bid and start paying your country immediately for licensing rights to get that oil. So you could immediately, even before any oil is extracted, you could immediately start turning it into something beneficial for your country. But there are some risks of foreign direct investment, and we ought to look at the risks of foreign direct investment from the perspective of the company. A company that is investing billions of dollars into your country will be concerned with possible changes in environmental regulations. Perhaps when your country is poor and desperate that you aren't as concerned about the environmental impact, but once the money starts to flow and there's other people that are looking at, um, at, at the, the impact of the drilling, they might change what kind of rules are um, have to be followed, which might make the cost of drilling oil even more expensive or impossible until it's overcome. Putting, uh, and that risk is something that the company is considering as a very real risk and a danger in um, being able to make a, a knowledgeable bid that will actually result in profits for them. I'm not saying that environmental regulations themselves are bad, it's just that it's a risk that the company has to consider about how likely it is that environmental regulations will change unilaterally without any consideration for uh, contracts that are placed this year. There's also the risk of unstable regimes or communist sympathies. One of the things that happens in a developing country is that that country could have civil wars or they could have foreign uh, uh, interests try to uh, usurp or, uh, or, or enter into the country. There might be all sorts of different scenarios that we've seen in the past that would uh, mean that any contract m made between the company and the current ruling uh, party might be invalidated. One of the uh, common things that communists come, uh, when, a, when a country goes communist, they often seize all uh, properties, private properties for the state ownership. And that would mean that any investments that were made by the company this year 
might be lost entirely to the new communist regime. And that's a risk that they consider, especially in developing countries. Stability uh, would be um, uh, preferable to something that's unstable. There's also the amount of debt or poor earnings that the company will ex experience until the, the investment in your country pays off. And during that time, their sh share price will be down and the risk that the high cost of financing that debt could threaten their, um, their livelihood and cash flow, earnings power and stock performance is a very risk that they can face too. It's not guaranteed, all of these are risks, but it's something that they consider. And there is that chance that there might not be as much light, sweet crude in the ground as they hoped. And if it turns out that, that their project, projected uh, reserves are much lower than they, um, uh, or were higher than the, what were actually there, then that's a danger that they run. So it's appropriate that the company should take these risks, though. My, my opinion and, and point of view is that, that they should be the ones that take the risk. That's why companies exist, to take risks, and they're the best ones suited for it. However, economic hitmen come on the scene and they provide an evil alternative. John Perkins talks about how he, they would target a particular country, let's say Indonesia, and he would send in, John Perkins would go into uh, Indonesia and talk to the, the leaders of Indonesia and bring a briefcase full of money and basically bribe them to look at these projections and say, you should hire us to... Um, uh, look to do these wonderful projections, uh, these, these economic projections on, on, on the types of things we can do. See, the, uh, John Perkins would represent, say, an engineering company as well as some banks and some oil companies. And he would say, if you hire us to get the oil out, to build your hydroelectric dams, to, to build up your country, then I, I can show you these projections. You're going to be very, very wealthy. And furthermore, if... Um, you borrow money from the World Bank to do so, then you'll be uh, very lucky. See, we call it black gold. If your country has it, then your country has a ticket to a greater GDP. We can expect it to court on the world stage by every member of the G20, that is to say the governments of the 20 most industrialized countries in the world. Great news. Exploration teams are coming back with the reports of massive oil reserves within your borders. The bad news, your greatness, is that our petroleum is a thousand kilometers deep into the jungle and under five miles of rock. I vey. If we harness this resource, our production possibilities frontier will expand, the incomes of our people will increase, and employment and services will grow. We will advance our civilization. Shell oil will um, be interested in the nature of the scenario, and it's very expensive to get that oil. There's currently no easy way to access the region, so a road and probably a railroad will need to be built. Then a power source will be needed to either build a hydroelectric dam and generator will need to be constructed, or else an oil-burning power plant will be erected. The oil wells need to be drilled, and housing for the workers in the oil fields are part of the project, too. Heavy equipment breaks down, and the means to connect the site with the outside world might include building a landing strip or air traffic control. The expected outflow of oil must be expected to be large to justify all this spending. But we're not done with the required infrastructure yet. A pipeline needs to be built to efficiently conduct the oil to the coast. Once there, the super tankers need to be accommodated. These huge ships are longer than four football fields. The tiny ports in a developing country are not able to receive these leviathons, so a new, modern port will need to be built. All of these before Shell sees one drop of oil make it to their refineries. The expense of this undertaking is enough to dissuade Shell from warming the idea to foreign direct investment. When we consider that the investment will be spent years before the projects are completed and begin to show any return on investment, we can understand why Shell might want to explore another option. So this group, the corporatocracy, is um, a name Perkins coined to describe the web of multinational firms which cooperate with one another for mutual benefit, without regard to nationalism, and always with an eye towards exploitation and power. He challenges us to think beyond the labels we so often use, like China and U.S. interests, and instead recognize that most governments are in place in the indulgence of the multinational corporations. The economic hitmen are the ambassadors of the corporatocracy. When Perkins met with the head of state of Indonesia, he was delivering two things. The first package was full of promising economic projections about the growth Indonesia could have if they developed their infrastructure, and the other package was a briefcase full of money. Your Excellency, Please accept this gift from my friends at Maine, Bechtel, and PLN. 
You may use this gift in any way you please. I hope you are as excited as we are about the benefits the proposed power plants will have in this country. Imagine if all of Indonesia could be lighted up with electricity. The benefits to production and employment and the huge increases in GDP you can see from these economic projections. The World Bank at the time was headed by Robert McNamara and as an institution it was designed to provide loans to the developing world for these types of projects. The industrialized democracies and capitalist countries contributed to the World Bank and countries in the so-called Third World borrowed from the World Bank. The Second World were the Communist Socialist countries and the time primarily USSR and China. The World Bank in and of itself was not and is not an exploitive institution, but it was used by the economic hitmen to reach their ends. Your Excellency, these projects to improve your country can be funded through the World Bank. We can arrange to have your loans deposited in one of our banks in the U.S. and you can write the checks to the contractors as the jobs progress along. You will have absolute power of the purse. We only ask that you choose ourselves and friends to build these projects. It was done in 1974 in Saudi Arabia, in the House of Saud, the royal family of this country agreed to invest billions of dollars of oil income to U.S. securities and to allow the U.S. Department of Treasury to use the interest from those investments to hire U.S. firms to build power, water systems, highways, ports, and cities in the kingdom. In exchange, the U.S. guarantees the royal family will continue to rule. So the co corporatocracy manages to get Ecuador to borrow the money and build the power plants, pipelines, roads, and ports themselves. The projects are now profit makers instead of foreign direct expenses. Furthermore, when the debt builds up and cannot be paid back, then the corporatocracy uses the debt to extract favors like selling the oil for a low price or getting Ecuador to vote a certain way at the UN. Suppose you turn down the economic hit, man, you might say. Take your money. Get out of here. I have seen what your projects have done in my neighboring countries. They are shouldered with tremendous debt, and I will never be able to pay it off. The cost of these projects is too much, and the benefit is much smaller than you have projected, Mr. Perkins. I want nothing to do with you or your friends. One leader who expressed this sentiment was Omar Torrijos of Panama. John Perkins confessed in his book that he liked Omar very much, and so he responded by telling him, What you say is the truth. These projections are lies, and what we are really after is the control of your country through debt. A few people will become wealthy, but the average citizen will be worse off. But please, take the money anyway. If I leave, they will send the jackals, and the jackals will not be carrying a briefcase of money, but will be carrying machine guns. They will kill you and replace you with someone who will take the money and doesn't care about his people. In 1981, Ecuadorian President Jaime Roldos, who was against American oil interests, and Panamanian President Omar Torrijos, who wanted Panama Canal to be strictly under Panamanian rule, both died in fiery airplane crashes that had markings of CIA assassinations, according to John Perkins. So, events like this have shaped our foreign policy, and in many corners of the world, all Americans are considered guilty because of the actions of some Americans. One note of caution. We're supposed to accept John Perkins' claims, while at the same realizing he admits to making his living lying to people. He was a professional con man at an international level, and a reasonable amount of skepticism is not unwarranted. But you might want to research United Fruit, Becoming Chiquita, and Kermit Roosevelt and the Shah of Iran. Thank you very much.